So, um, as you can see, I've, I've fed a question through to Sally today. Um, you did uh, mention and touch on before some of the, uh, the inhibitors and silences, and, yeah. and I commend you for doing so because um, around intervention, language, culture, and of course, ethnicity and religious um, affiliations uh, are very important um, factors to consider. Uh, so you mentioned disclosure earlier, um, and the question, of course, is um, how can we help overcome the cultural backgrounds, um, or sorry, the cultural barriers, and of course, um, um, leading into that, does cultural background play a role in that disclosure? Mm. I mean, the the easy answer, um, Helen, to that question is is absolutely yes, and that that plays itself out um, very regularly for us. Uh, in that um, the, the more, when you think about it, we're talking about little, little children all the way through to young people and older adolescents. I should have said, I forgot to do this, I'm sorry, that the definition of child is the definition used by the United Nations. So um, up to age 18 is the definition that we're using. So you can readily see that at each stage in that child and young person's progression through their life inside their own culture, there will be a number of things that, um, a number of cultural aspects of their development that impact upon their ability to speak. And we do see those um, play out. We see them play out not just in cultural settings, we see them play out in um, well, sometimes the cultural setting is also a religious setting, and you heard me touch upon that um, public hearing that we did uh, last year. Um, we've, you would have seen us probably do public hearings with respect to a number of faith-based communities, which include the Catholic Church, the Salvation Army, the Anglican Church, um, uh, and and those uh, those cultural and religious loyalties, if I can use that term loosely, will have an enormous impact upon a, a, a child or adolescent's ability to feel um, able to speak in the context of inhibitors like um, stigma, fear, guilt, shame um, and taboos and even and even the actual language, whether or not those are words that can be spoken, um, will sometimes be the inhibitor in and of itself. So they are an enormous issues for us. Um, in terms of what can be done about, about that, we're still, of course, in our um, absorbing stage, so we're, we're equally here to, to listen to people's ideas about um, the sorts of things, any ideas that people have in the room. As I said, that's, we're in our sponge-like stage at the moment. So whilst we are getting some research in about the sorts of things that help, um, we, we, we so value uh, what, what anyone can say about them. The sorts of things that we've been told are if I could find a trusted person outside the community, some have said, interestingly, a person who I thought, um, because of that, all of those range of fears that we've talked about, if I could find a person who I could identify as outside my community, but that I could trust to speak to about these things, that would have helped me. Some will say that they are looking for a trusted person inside the community, and um, that, that both of those make sense. Uh, it, you know, I mean, these, these complex problems require complex solutions, so there are no simple solutions to any of this. Uh, we've had a lot of people talk to us about the importance of um, community awareness raising. And as I said, we're hoping that we're doing a little bit of it by our public work. We get some feedback that we are. So in other words, that very first barrier of this 
this this is not this can't be happening. I don't believe it. Um, so that that importance of the general cult cultural awareness raising, and then of course the need for um, targeted specific cultural awareness raising in a in a culturally appropriate way, um, so that it's not um, it's not blaming and and um, shrill and and negative, but obviously the opposite of all of those opposite of all of those things. So there are some ideas out there about uh, about the way in which this should be done. Um, people are talking to us about the sorts of programs that should be inside schools. We've had some young people talk to us about um, what would be of assistance to them inside their schools, in particular focusing um, on what to do if a peer discloses to you. Because one of the things that we know from some inquiries that have gone before us and that have happened in um, other nations is that peer-to-peer -peer disclosure is not, is not uncommon. In other words, I'll be prepared to tell my friend because she'll understand, she'll know what I'm talking about and I trust her and I'll get some relief and some sense of support from that. But we've heard from some fantastic young people inside schools who've been talking to us that whilst that has happened, the, the young person themselves has felt totally unprepared <coughs> and ill-equipped to know what to do with that information. So we've got it's a space to work in there, I think, too, with respect to talking to young people and, again, significantly for us this evening, how that might work across our diverse communities is something we need to really pay attention to as well because we know one size is not going to fit all. My, my question is, um, and, and we see it quite often in our work with young people, is with our newer communities, it's often quite difficult um, or it takes some time to develop that relationship for there to be a disclosure. And, and given that that's our, our experience, I'm just curious to know how the Commission has navigated that so that there's that um, connection with our newer communities so that um, their issues c can be highlighted. So we have... Um, if the answer to that is... Uh, in as many possible ways as we can. But if you've got ideas or if people want to say to us, we're, you know, you need to do this or you need to do that, that's what we're here to hear tonight as well. Um, so we have been um, actively trying to engage in as many different ways as we can think of with representative agencies of children and young people to try and um, get to hear what they want to say to us in contemporary Australia across all of its diversity. So we're, we're doing that and we've had, um, we've had some engagement. We're working from um, uh, various parts of, I hesitate to use the word bureaucracy, but that's really the proper word to use. Um, so in other words, using like the um, Children and Young Persons Commissioners and their equivalents right around the nation. We've had quite a lot of engagement with them and we're taking guidance from them about where um, we can continue to make uh, inroads into getting to speak with young people right now. Um, hence, as I said, we're getting some information back. We also have a, um, have a very specific program in place in our private sessions program. So. Uh, Sally and, and her team have done an enormous amount of work in um, assisting us to actually hear from children and young people in our private sessions. So I personally have had some, um, I think, 12-year-olds in and, and then certainly older uh, teenagers, 14 and 15-year-olds. And that's, as you can imagine, a profoundly important experience for us. So as well as engaging with the agencies, we're also um, trying to work uh, also 
directly with children and young people via their families who are bringing them in to, into private sessions. Sally, you're in charge of the microphone. Uh, Your Honour, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm a mental health nurse and um, um, more to do with more pe personal experience in relation to talking about best practice in, in terms of children and uh, looking at the future for what can be provided. This is more to do with a question in relation to how do we keep children safe in the residential care, especially when they come from a, a multicultural background, when they are vulnerable and they are not able to protect themselves. We're thinking about a child who cannot speak, and yet on a night shift, there's just a male staff on duty. We would like to see a policy which ensures that there's both male and female staff on residential care for young, vulnerable children. Thank you. And thank you, thank you for that, um, for that comment. And uh, we, as you, you, you might have heard me say before, we are currently in the uh, in the process of working through our whole out-of-home care policy development, ultimately culminating in uh, our recommendations for that area of our work by the end of next year. But you absolutely hit upon a very particular area of vulnerability already for those deeply vulnerable children and young people who are in out-of-home care. Um, and so that is that is a very significant issue for us, and um, we would again value uh, your ideas. And you've given you've made a couple of points already. Um, the first is male staff for a, a, a female, obviously a, a very significant issue. Um, language difficulties. What is the institution? doing about that? What does the institution understand about what it needs to do to ensure that that institution is child safe? So um, thank you. Um, Commissioner Jennifer Cote, thank you so much for um, the presentation today. It actually gave us a really thorough understanding of how it works. And I'd like to congratulate your staff. You have been so caring uh, in terms of communicating with all of us uh, how the commission works. Uh, now, my question is really around primary prevention, community awareness raising. And you would know that now the Labour government in Victoria has been really quite generous <laughs> in not only uh, providing more funding into community organizations, but coming out with the recent report on, on the family violence. Now, while we are very happy with what's happening, we, we do feel in the community that w there's so much that we need to do. Okay, okay? good. And we do know that it's about community awareness. Um, however, um, and our, the, the, the business, the, the, the work that we do with the Women's Coalition, is actually to empower women to be uh, uh, to be the messengers, you know, of information to the community, and we also try to develop in our women the empathy, you know, so that they become actually, be, uh, you know, trusted people and we, uh, in, the, in 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 the community, just like what you're talking about. And I can see you have a deadline, okay, for the recommendations. What we will probably play a bigger role later on is actually that post-report, you know, primary prevention work. Now, we would like to know how we can work with you in, the, in, in that space. But before that also, I'd like to tell you that apart from the mainstream, um, you know, uh, institutions, 
what we're finding in the community is there are a lot of little institutions, you know, that, uh, for example, I can just give you an example. There's so many little Christian denominations, you know, within many of our communities. Uh, I wonder how, if they have already presented, if there are any cases uh, on around this issue that have been presented from those little Christian denominations. Uh, I mean, I think there's so much there to actually do in terms of reaching out to the hard to reach groups. So we would like to know how the commission will still be working with us post report in terms of really getting to that hard to reach okay. communities. A couple of things in there, mm. no, but the, we, will, we will come to an end um, it, in December of 2017 because we are, we're not um, an entity beyond um, our inquiry. So we'll dissolve um, back into, into the community. But you raise a really important point, what happens to the, to the recommendations? How do we ensure that um, an appropriate response is made to them and the, and the appropriate, um, I suppose, oversight of the making of those responses, uh, the response to those recommendations happens. And um, uh, that's something that we would value your input in and I, I, I would encourage you to keep talking to Sally about ide ideas that you might have or indeed anyone else about how that might work beyond the life of the Commission. Because we're, we're um, an inquiry, we're a piece of machinery, if you like, and we dissolve, um, as I said af after that, hopefully not literally, but um, uh, we, 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 don't, uh, we don't exist beyond the, the terms of our appointment. Um, in answer to your question about are we getting information from those much smaller, less known communities. Um, in particular, I think you referred to um, some religious communities. The answer to that is, well, we are. Um, we don't know um, because people, of course, are voluntarily coming forward to us. So we don't know how, how much um, spread we're getting. In other words, we don't know, well, there are you know, 36 of those organisations in the suburbs of Melbourne and we've heard about five of them. We don't, we don't know it in those terms, but we are getting information from the smaller, um, lesser known groups. Um, I forgot to mention actually, um, an, uh, it just reminded me when you were talking about those um, uh, smaller, less um, well-structured institutions, if you like, that um, some of you may have, uh, again, seen us do a public hearing into um, an ashram that, uh, yes, so that was, um, that was an ashram that certainly had, uh, had its basis um, offshore out of Australia, indeed uh, based in, in India, but there were um, uh, devotees of the ashram that were placed in, uh, in originally in northern New South Wales and spread out across Australia and that was um, uh, very, very much focused on some of those di difficulties that we've already spoken about this evening. My question is uh, just when you have mentioned that the small group groups are me, uh, uh, missed out sometimes. Uh, I work for the new emerging communities from every single communities when they first arrived in this country. And then when I see the approach from the national and the state, there are always a different cohort of. If you go to ECCV and FECA, they have their own cohort. If you go to Victorian Multicultural Commission, they have the largest people. But if you go to local government, they have their own community leaders. Every single organization have different. By most and large effective I see in Victoria is the Victorian Multicultural Commission and with the youth CMY. Why? Because in Victorian Multicultural Commission they will come because there is a funding available through that. They will not come to any other 
events are function and come and talk to you if there's nothing for them. Mm -hmm. My question is now how do what is the mechanism that in each state you're going to approach? Because asking one advocacy organization or one settlement service provider does not bring the last cohort of people left behind. Mm -hmm. There are gatekeeper leaders. Mm -hmm. There are opportunist leaders. There are some taboo leaders. Mm -hmm. So, and then the real victim or culprit doesn't come out. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know what mechanism is there to bring out those lost boys, mm -hmm. because the topic itself. See, I'm a little bit average person to understand, and it is nothing to me. But many, many community, new community. What is it? It's nothing for them. It doesn't impact their centering money. It doesn't impact their job. It doesn't impact anything because they have a safe roof here in Australia after living 25 years in the refugee camp. So it's nothing for them. Mm. So how that awareness is going to come? Or oh, there's something wrong. Mm. So that's one. Uh, so and the quickly, uh, the other one is very sensitive. Does this commission consider FGM and GM as the sex uh, abuse of sex uh, abuse of sexual abuse of children? Thank you. Okay. I'll, take, I'll, I'll try and deal with those two issues. Um, so what I understand is really your, the issue that you raise in this forum is what about the people who, are, who don't have a voice inside the community, inside the community, as it were. So they are sitting for whatever reason um, trying to... Um, make their way here in as um, safe and positive way as possible, but don't feel able to, for a range of reasons that you've given, to be able to, uh, do you mean speak out, speak with the Commission? Yeah. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very good point. Um, we, we uh, I suppose what I can say about that is we are trying to um, look that issue square in the face. In other words, yes, there will be, there will be um, the face of some communities which is not necessarily um, the truth. Uh, and we face that in many of the cases that we deal with that we will get layers of information as we move through the work that we do. So we'll get the official voice from the institution about what's happening and what's meant to be happening and here are our manuals and here are our guidelines and here's our training and here's our code of conduct. And our investigators and our staff and our team will not take that at face value because especially in circumstances where we're getting reports out of communities that you can have all of the manuals and all of the guidelines and all of the codes of conduct um, in the world, but if they're not actually having an impact to the, to the people that we are aiming to protect, then something's going wrong between the front door and the rooms at the back of the house, to use that image. So I, I guess I'm, I'm answering that by saying we, we don't take at face value what we're hearing from the official spokespeople from any community, uh, especially not if we have information that's coming to us confidentially, as it usually is, from other sources saying, yeah, you'll hear that, not true. So. That's all part of the, I guess, the professional work of an inquiry. Um, and I think the second part of w what you asked me was about um, FGM and whether or not um, we are doing any work in that space. Uh, we don't have a particular, we don't have a position about whether or not that uh, does come within our terms of reference or not. I can anticipate that there may well be circumstances where. Um, it would, if it came, um, if it, it it would have to be um, in Australia, uh, and there would be other circumstances that would have to attach itself to an institutional context for us. So, um, it, yeah, 
it's a, it's a terrible answer to say it depends, but it does. Um, so we're certainly not, ruling, certainly not ruling it out. Thank you so much. And it's such a positive, progressive move forward when we're finally talking about these issues publicly. Yeah. Um, and I guess for me, without being ironic, I, we're not talking about detention centres, are we? Although they're an institution. Uh, we, we, again, are not ruling that out either. And we are um, receiving some information and any other information that anyone has, we will take. Um, yeah. And look, simply, I mean, I will focus just on one point, although there's a myriad of issues that come to mind when we're speaking about uh, obviously child sexual abuse but for me the issue is about age and what is an age of an adult versus a child within yeah. the context of faith religion and Islam um, and uh, arranged marriages versus forced marriages and those issues and tensions around what constitutes abuse and or not mm. and how do we have the conversation without understanding gender and the role that women play within communities and who are the power brokers inside those communities who are defining what is, because in your terms of reference, you refer to cultural norms and standards within culture that are acceptable. And in our view, I guess, as women within the Islamic faith, we're beginning to critique what is considered acceptable whilst at the same time being mindful of stereotypes and a lot of Islamophobia and hostility levelled at Muslims. So the tensions ultimately between the, so the broader social context as well as, um, or their impact rather, on how and whether people would disclose around sexual abuse, the lesser of two evils. Do we stay with the abuse we know compared with the abuse we don't? Mm. And if not, how do we specifically um, develop services and systems and strategies that are genuinely safe, yeah. recognising those tensions. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and um, Hannah, it's people like you that bring that to us. Um, we, we really work, um, we work with those, with the knowledge, with the experience and with the understanding and, um, and we, we can't do it without you. We, we can't do it without you. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be really um, going nowhere. Um, we'll, simply be, um, we'll simply be reinforcing um, some of those barriers instead of um, breaking them down. So that's what's so important to us, to hear from you. Thank you. So my question is, how can cultural change be achieved in an environment lacking in transparency where the current and proposed governance structures, however glossy they may look, as you had just touched on, are not transparent, they are not accountable to the community, even what is proposed, and when a year later those same people remain in power, hence those same cultural taboos and a culture of fear persist, what, and in as much as community representation and advocacy has been established, what can a community that remains in pain and in fear do? So I'll be careful not to talk um, in, in, um, in detail, obviously, about that particular case because that report um, remains outstanding and soon enough will be made public. Uh, so some of those issues will be addressed in the report. Um, but what the questions that you, you frame um, are crucially important questions about governance structures and, and transparency and that difference between um, ticking boxes and saying we've got a code of conduct and we've got a set of rules and we've got some training as opposed to how that's actually um, playing itself out inside the institution is a recurring theme for us. We've seen that come through in a number of, um, in a number of case studies and indeed one of the very first ones we did was a, um, a public hearing into um, the YMCA and uh, some childcare facilities that it, it ran in Sydney. And I can talk about that one because it's already the subject now of a, of a public report. And they had manuals you couldn't jump over. 
um, and uh, pieces of paper that ticked boxes about um, training and about what what was being what was being done in terms of screening and employment processes and working with children checks. But when we came along and I guess took all of that apart, the deficiencies were absolutely clear. That young staff told us that you know on the first day that they got inducted they got the, the manuals got pointed at and they said oh when you get a moment have a look at those. Uh, they, we, we got evidence about um, the employment screening checks being again uh, very ineffectively done and so on and so on. So there's a need for um, monitoring and oversight of any of those sorts of structures in, in many of the institutions that we've been looking at. And that's certainly a conversation that's, that's going on um, at the moment. Uh, just in terms of framing up that question about, um, about transparency, because it's, it, it is an interesting one to talk about in this institutional context. Um, one of the things I, I often make the observation in terms of one of the things I often observe, I should say, about the work that we do is um, that until the truth gets told, um, that's the starting place. Until the truth gets told, nothing will change. We can't move. Because if we're stuck in a set of falsehoods and myths and, and, and you know, front doors being held closed, then um, we've failed. We haven't conducted the inquiry that we need to conduct. So the first and most important achievement, I think, um, we'll be tested against is have we, 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 we can't go to all of the institutions that have been reported to us. Sadly, over 3,000 institutions have been reported to us. So we have to take a representative sample and then from that start looking at these issues like the ones that you've identified that, that come out of the inquiries that we make, like governance structures and accountability and monitoring and oversight. And we hope to get to that um, in, a, in a variety of ways. And when I say get to it, I mean, sorry, that's a bit... Um, to slang, um, uh, we, we hope to deal with it in terms of recommendations in areas such as what makes a child safe institution. And um, again, in that, in that context, I anticipate that we'll see things like monitoring, oversight and evaluation. In other words, don't just stop at the front door and hear from those in charge of the institution, nothing to see here, folks, everything's going well. Um, so there needs to be some form of ongoing, what, what I'm saying is ongoing monitoring and oversight and indeed a requirement for evalu ongoing evaluation to satisfy the appropriate um, uh, overseeing bodies that what is being said is what is being done. I'm just curious, we talk about institutions, private organisations, private colleges, schools, sporting groups um, not being transparent. Uh, I think we all know that they aren't. Well, the ones in question aren't anyway. Um, why, how do we expect them to take this serious when we have a government that's not transparent, first of all? Uh, secondly, uh, I heard it was you, Helen, once. I heard you say that we have a uh, multicultural Australia, but we only have one legal system. And as an Australian, I don't believe that we have a system that's harsh and is taking child abuse seriously. Um, I believe that it's discriminating against multicultural children. Um, and I just feel like we've got to start from up here before we get down here in this one. Because the community's got to, yes, let's do community development awareness, let's, let's work with women and 
men and family violence agencies, everything. But at the end of the day, if we don't have a government that's taking this serious, I just don't think that my uncle at the mosque is going to take this serious. And he's going to cover it up. So I, I don't know if that was a comment or a question, but mm. I guess I'm Probably a bit a curious bit yeah. Yeah, about what the Commission thinks about the government and, and where they stand with all of this. Okay. Let, I'll, I'll just tip, I'll pick a few, a few things out of there because there was some commentary and, and a few questions in there. So you touched upon um, the criminal justice system and I, I, I haven't spent really in, any time on that tonight other than to say that there's a considerable amount of work uh, going on m largely behind the scenes of the work of the Royal Commission at the moment. Um, we've done a couple of public hearings. Uh, we've called in all the um, directors of public prosecutions as well as some defence barristers and asked them questions publicly about areas of the law that we think are um, areas that should be discussed in terms of this area. We've had lots of people talk to us, and you touched upon that, about um, sentencing and the inadequacy or otherwise of sentencing. We've also had people talk to us about um, appropriate responses to those perpetrating sexual abuse against children, be, be it sentencing responses all the way through to treatment responses. So we're, we're, again, getting lots of information in and we'll continue to work in that space. Um, in terms of um, the politics of what governments do and don't do, um, we try and uh, steer a steady but realistic course through that. Um, so we try and not get distracted by the politics of any given day. Uh, and keep focused on our terms of reference and what we have um, committed to do in terms of our task. And we try and do that as publicly as we can because um, we want people to know what we're doing. Uh, and we will make public, of course, all of our reports and all of our recommendations and then, a little bit like what I said to Melba before, we, we step back and, and we hand, it really then becomes the role of advocacy groups and um, both individuals and, and groups to hold uh, governments to account and say, well, you called on this Royal Commission, you put all of that money into it, um, now get on with it. They've, They've given you a range of tasks. So um, that, that's, that's what I would say to you about, um, about that part. And other than that, to say thanks very much for driving three hours at the end of a, a hard day to, um, to come here. It's fantastic. Well done. Hi, my name's Marcy Pinskia. Uh, and again, I'd like to congratulate you and thank everyone involved the Royal Commission for the phenomenal work and contribution you're making to our communities. Um, I work in governance and I, uh, the first session I attended was case study 22. I grew up in that community okay. and uh, I attended because my friend and colleague said to me it's important to go and be a witness. So I thought well I'll just go for a day to be a witness and I've been involved every day since okay. that week in February mm. of my life. There hasn't been a day I haven't thought about the work and contributed to the work at a grassroots level in my community since then. Um, uh, you've actually already talked and addressed some of the things I wanted to, to talk about today, but, but what, what I did want to say Many is... Many of them bear repeating, so um, <laughs> please yeah, I was, don't I was going that. to say, I think perhaps what I wanted to say was it's, it's very clear to many of us who are very focused at a grassroots level in that community, and I would suspect it's you would find there are comparable experiences in different communities well, right. also, that leaders of communities have stood up and um, spoken and made commitments. And probably the transcripts a year down the track do not reflect reality for the people in those communities. That's certainly been the experience in our community. Um, and there's not been accountability. Commitments that were made to the Commission and then documented and made to the community have not been followed through in terms of governance, in terms of moving forward hand in hand with the community. 
And um, I wanted to just take a moment. I was thinking about policy because uh, before you addressed it, because very commonly that's what organisations do. They say we have to, you know, to, to tick our boxes. We, are, you know, it's the governance space. We need to comply with policy. Yeah. So it's very easy to tick the boxes on policy. But I've been thinking about it, and I think one of the means to really address these issues is to have external um, monitoring. I think it's really important post the commission organisations that have, if not all organisations, need to be externally accredited the way many other healthcare organisations might be externally accredited. So for example, um, Yeshiva Melbourne in the last week has had some great celebration going out about the Australian Childhood Foundation just ticking it off as the first safeguarding children organisation school in Australia. Great celebration of ticking off many, many policies. But you Yes, many photos. But you don't want to go into that school and talk to um, many of the community, the teachers, the parents, what's going on about there. There is such a culture of fear, and we all know that's exactly when children aren't safe. So there hasn't been tra transition. And, it, uh, and I, so I would like to perhaps suggest to the Commission as a recommendation going forward, really looking at sending people in just as for external accreditation, that it's more about what's on paper and it's what's happening on ground and in the room. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, you've just reminded me of um, a, a couple of things I've, I've, I've omitted to say, which is um, for those interested that the transcripts of everything that's said in those public hearings at the Commission is, of course, public on our website. It's a very laborious task. I, I don't wish that on, um, on anyone. But for those who are interested, and in the interest of transparency, um, every word that's spoken in the public hearings uh, is published unless we um, make an order for non-publication, which um, occasionally, for a few limited reasons, we will do and we'll just keep it as, um, as tightly held as possible. So that's the first thing. And, and I also omitted to say, just in answer to, um, in particular to, um, well, really a couple of comments about about transparency, yours as well, is that we do propose next year in our public hearing space to, and we've, we've made this fairly clear to some organisations, so I feel comfortable in saying it here tonight, is that we do propose to ask some institutions back before the Royal Commission um, to be re-examined or to report back. Uh, and um, some of those institutions have been put on notice already about that. Um, so, but we're, we're still making decisions about how that might work. Could I just say, sorry, also pertinent to the transcripts, I think it's really noteworthy that the extracts are also, the exhibits are also on the site. You're right. For example, there are key documents that were never available to this community, such as organisational constitutions, were always withheld from the um, community. And after literally years and years of requesting them, it was the first time the community was able to source such basic documentation because it was available to us through the Commission website. Compelled by the Commission. Major thanks mm. again. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Meyer. I'm the CEO of CEDEC, a sure. support and advocacy group for um, service for survivors in this Jewish community. Nice to see you. And, and again, I reiterate and commend you and the other commissioners on this um, endeavour that you've been through. I concur with similar, the similar um, comments made. I just wanted to add s two other um, phenomena that have, I've found um, within the community. Um, certainly, the whole issue of managing the sex offender in the community has been a, an anxiety that has, um, I'm constantly getting mm. um, consultations from mm. institutions about that, that very um, dilemma and, and um, pleased to hear that that is something that's being addressed, but it's certainly an anxiety that's raised quite often by um, institutional um, leadership. The other issue for me in the Jewish community is that the voice of the woman has been silenced in this, in this whole domain. It has been very much a, a male voice that has been heard, and I'm trying to promote that more and more, that we hear the female voice 
in this, um, in this whole domain in our community. Uh, we have also, um, one of the comments I make about your, the definition that's put here today is that we have to be um, mindful that um, one of the most significant issues is peer-to-peer -peer abuse and child-to-child -child abuse. And that's another issue that we're seeing more of and, and we're, we're receiving consultations about that whole issue and how, how that's being managed. And I would say that that's um, a real complexity for institutions to manage. And I'm not, from what I'm seeing, that, that that's um, probably another area where institutional responses need to be addressed. You're right. I'm sure that that has um, resonance for a number of other communities within our, commu our community. Um, so, so thank you for those um, observations. I'm, my name is Srinivas and I'm a commissioner in the Victorian Multicultural Commission. Uh, you talked about, in fact, you emphasized the need for truth to come out uh, in the deliberations. What my, uh, uh, I'm sure you, you have very well-meaning people who interview the affected people, the youth and the children. But I'm just wondering about the cultural sensitivity training of those people who interview the people who are affected to get at the truth and also I think it will be most beneficial if, the, if you could co-opt some people with such culturally trained, culturally competent, culturally sensitive people. I'm not saying it's not happening now, I do not know. It's quite possible that you're already doing it, in which case I'm very grateful, but if not, I would like you to consider how we can improve the quality of the truth from the people who are affected comes out during this commission. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. And a very, um, a very important point um, to be made. Um, the answer is yes, we, we do have um, members of uh, various diverse communities uh, ass assisting us on the staff. But um, as you were raising that issue, uh, um, it seems to me that um, there's an there's an, a second a second important and perhaps even more fundamental um, issue contained in what you raise, which is um, about approaches to the police and all of the um, cultural barriers that exist there. We haven't touched upon those um, tonight. I can um, assure you that we we have an awareness about about those issues. Um, do we have all the solutions? Um, definitely not. But again, um, if I just st can stimulate some of these great brains in the room to think about um, those issues, they've been brought to our attention, but we need, again, your assistance to give us guidance about what would help g g gender issues, f first and foremost, um, language and cultural issues and taboos and concerns about what members of the community might see me going in there, what it, what it means to be seen talking to the police, indeed what it means to approach.
commitments and principles, which include coming back to this whole issue about monitoring and, and oversight and evaluation and how do you know what you're doing is actually working. Because um, evaluation is pretty light on the ground as we, as we look around. Um, I, and I think then your um, next issue was about um, concerns about peer-to-peer -peer abuse, but in particular um, across the social media platforms. Uh, we have, we have in, inside our terms of reference, dealt with some, um, some peer to, well, considerable numbers of peer-to-peer -peer abuse, um, and some of it, uh, um, just trying to, some of it I think has been via um, the use of social media and certainly um, some of the perpetrators, the adult perpetrators, have used social media to um, groom and both encourage participation of um, children uh, in sexual activity as well as um, use it as a threat to keep them silent in terms of reporting. So in that way we have intersected with the social media platform, but not in a not not just in a in a general way, because of course we, we need to constantly keep referring back to our terms of reference to anchor ourselves um, in our in our work. So we have come across it in that way. Um, but peer-to-peer -peer abuse more generally, and I think it's been raised um, in a few different um, spots tonight, is uh, a, a very real issue in the context of um, inst institutional abuse and abuse in an institutional context. So that's a matter that we are giving considerable um, attention to. With respect to your third point, I, I wasn't. Um, what I understand you're saying is that some um, very explicit photographs are making their way into into the public. Is that uh, what's happening? Uh, just, a general, just, a, just a general observation in that. We, we have seen, uh, and, and, and maybe it's not directly related to uh, child sexual abuse, but we have seen photos of children that are not decent, that are not, that are not, um, that are not. They're not de-identified. De Yes, yeah. and, and they're not. We, we, you cannot. We cannot call that uh, treating someone else with dignity and respect. We certainly can't. And I think the whole point is uh, maybe it's a matter of morality versus what is real, mm -hmm. and some of that is really. Uh, I think we, it, it needs to be looked at in that context. I wonder if I could get you to just talk to Sally afterwards uh, um, ab about that, and um, just so that we make sure we fully understand uh, what, what that is um, that you've. Uh, that you've seen. I am Dr. Mimi Watts and I'm a commissioner with the Victoria Multicultural Commission. I'm a Cameroonian African woman Hello, and doctor. I'm also a lecturer at Victoria University. And sexual health is one of the things that I talk a lot to young people. So it's a, it's a course that I think personally I've spoken to people informally about. But one of the key things that I have observed when it comes to child sexual abuse is the entrenched poverty and lack of opportunities, but the gender inequalities that exist within the family and community where girls in particular have to be very submissive but obey unquestionably, which means if somebody is using advantage of that and grooming them, there is a risk factor, but poverty and all these other underlying issues. So how is the commission addressing such things. Then the second point is more policy recommendation. You've spoken a lot around prevention. And I think it's about how do you have members from those cultural groups in particular who are culturally competent but sensitive and culturally aware, which really picks on my fellow commissioners point around the cultural sensitivities, cultural awareness, and also that um, um, the messages that you are giving, but the information that you are also gathering, the outcomes will reach the most unreachable. Mm. Because from the beginning of this conversation, you did also talk about creating opportunities around bringing people in, paying for their transport, reimbursement, etc. There are people that 
even with all of that, they will not get the messages, but they will never be confident yeah. to walk into this room to share that. Sure. How do we go to those people, and what are you doing about that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, one of the things we're doing about that is talking to you so that you can help us do that. Let me just start with your, um, with the first point that you made, and I, 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 what I understood, Doctor, was that you were really saying that there are, you were really, I suppose, putting um, another layer on the barriers to, to, um, to, well, perhaps not so much barriers, another layer to the risk and vulnerability for a child and young person, which is entrenched poverty, which makes that child or young person more vulnerable than a child or young person that is not suffering in those circumstances. Um, and, and that's correct. There's no, I, 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 personally, I, I absolutely agree with you. So the task at hand is to um, recognise, at firstly, recognise that range of vulnerabilities um, and extra vulnerabilities that exist inside some communities as opposed to others and um, ensure that when we're looking at um, safety for children, there's an understanding that what you identify is an extra level of risk. Um, that's, that's what I you know, see as a really important part of that institutional safety that needs to be um, that needs to be thought about, and yes, the voice, the voiceless. Um, how do we get to the voiceless? And that's a question we ask ourselves every day. Are we are we getting to where we need to talk about, and that who we need to talk to? And you you will have heard that come through. Um, tonight uh, in, in many and varied ways. So people can be children and young people and adults who we want to talk to who have experienced sexual abuse in that institutional setting. Um, for many of them, the impact of what has happened to them will be the silencer because they're experiencing the impact through mental health problems and drug and substance abuse problems and they're existing in the fringes of our community um, largely as a result of the impact of the very thing that we're, um, that we're talking about. So we, there are a number of um, organisations and advocacy groups that are working very hard to do outreach with those people and assist those people if they wish to. Uh, we would never obviously force anyone to come and speak with us, but that if they wish to, to give them the opportunity to, um, to have that discussion with us. Sometimes people would prefer to, to um, write with the assistance of someone to do the writing for them. Again, for obvious reasons, that part of losing one's or not having a voice is not having the capacity to actually participate in mainstream community because you don't have the tools that we in the mainstream community have, which is literacy and, and um, language. So we, we continue to try, but I'm, I'm serious when I say to you that's, that's where um, all of you come in um, from our point of view. Um, thank you. I realise it's, it's getting very late in the evening, so I'll oh. be directly to the point. Um, my name is Maggie Toko. I uh, am representing the Victorian Mental Illness Awareness Council. And um, it was interesting that you just said mental health because that's yeah. exactly what I want to talk about, yeah. which is the fact that many of the consumers who we represent um, have a diagnosis which comes from a history of abuse. I've, uh, we currently have a, a, a group of 
young people who um, are joining our service as members who have been uh, in the system for a very long time and through their mental health aren't really taken seriously enough. And so I've certainly heard tonight how people are talking about um, the different cultural aspects and so on. And I think if you have, um, if you are from a linguistically diverse culture and you have a mental illness, then you're really behind the eight ball because people um, and clinicians, uh, as, um, as good as some are, are very easy to blame, you know, say people are delusional, um, and so on and so on. And it's just, and I think it's sad. But uh, certainly we're going to um, work hard to make sure that that stigma's broken down. And I think you're right when you've said, like with Hannah and things like that, it's people speaking up, not staying silent, having a voice and driving it home that, that, Enough is not enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie, for bringing that issue um, to the forefront as well. And uh, we've certainly um, we've had people talk to us about their oh. sexual abuse actually inside um, institutions uh, that they were placed in because of their mental health issues. Um, so in terms of talking about vulnerabilities, um, that's that's one that uh, um, unfortunately and sadly um, rears its head regularly in our work. But uh, you, you you're right too, as um, as we've already said, it is also <coughs> part of the um, part of the regular impact as well because of its effect on the complete um, disintegration of um, of a person who has been assaulted in that way at that formative time in their life. Oh, I've got to, I've got to get off the podium and let um, Emma say some final words. I'm mindful of the time, so I'll keep my comments incredibly brief. Uh, look, thank you all very much for coming along tonight. I think there's been real generosity in the room, actually, in terms of people sharing their voice and sharing their experience um, and um, very compelling, I think, in terms of listening to the experience of everyone in this room and looking at how you're contributing that experience to the work of the Commission. So it's been an invaluable opportunity. Um, if I can just reiterate, if there's any other feedback that you would like to share with the Commission, please contact the Commission. The details were up earlier. They'll be available at, at the desk on the way out as well. So if, you, if there's other opportunities to have, um, to take, to have your voice heard, Obviously, um, I don't think I need to encourage anyone in this room to stay engaged in the process of the Royal Commission and, and, to, uh, and um, the proceedings and to make sure that we keep those policy discussions happening as well. Uh, so really, if you could all join with me in thanking um, Justice Coates for, her, um, for, for taking the time to spend with us tonight. Thank you all and I, um, I wish you a lovely rest of your evening. Thanks. <laughs>